right, guys, how are you? Welcome to tonight. Welcome to the event. I know everybody's been waiting a long time to hear this. It's This is like a month in the making. Um, and guys, I just put out a basic post about subject twos and why did I put the post out? Basically, I'm putting this post out because everybody, all my students um, that I've mentored, all the people in our, our groups that I mentored have been hitting me up lately. And all of a sudden, they're asking me about subject twos. And I got, you know, I, I was with Don DeRosa a couple months ago out in Florida, and I, I was with Jeff Richmond out in North Carolina, and uh, I didn't get to sit with Harry out there. And I know Dan really well on Facebook. He's crushing it. And I asked, I said I asked about six people. I had probably 20-something people come on and say they want to be panelists. But as you know in the group, my biggest thing is I want to bring the experts on. I don't want to be the expert. I'll bring the guys who are really doing this business the right way, the wrong way, whatever it might be. Be, and they're going to teach you how, how they do it, how to protect yourself, what to look out for. So I know we're going to be really busy today, so I don't want to spend too much time myself doing introductions, but let me just tell you who's on the panel today. I got Dan Diaz on here. Dan Diaz is a very avid investor himself. His first deal was a subject to deal. I think he made about eighty dollars or $100,000 on that deal, and he's going to tell you why he does not. He's going to actually be, be the other side of it, the other shoe. He's going to tell you why he's essentially against subject to deals from novice investors. And he's not saying for everybody, but he's saying for novice investors. And that's why it's so important to have him on here because he's not here telling you how great it is. Everybody should do it. Join my club, pay my fees or anything like that. Then I got Jeff Richmond, who is essentially one of the biggest experts in this industry, so much so that he has his own mastermind group. He has his own students in the group. He has his own Facebook group where I've learned a ton from, from Jeff Richmond on this. I got a chance to sit with him briefly in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I asked him, I said, you, I, I got to do this. I got to bring you on, but I got to bring you on this way. You're going to answer questions for the group. I think it's so kind to do that. Don DeRosa, who's out of Atlanta, Georgia. Don has been in his business for a long time. Don is not only doing this day in and day out in his business, but he teaches this all over the U.S. in different RIA groups and different meetup groups. Don has his own group, and Don has been kind enough to do this with us too. And then we have the infamous Harry Marsh. And all I've been hearing it's Harry Marsh, Harry Marsh, Harry Marsh. Harry Marsh is an attorney. Harry Marsh is doing thousands of these deals himself. He's doing for his clients. I was in Charlotte. Everyone, I can't, it's a small world, but everyone I was doing business with, all my mentees out there that I taught, all the groups I was at, they're like, dude, you, and they didn't even know I was talking about subject to. They're like, you got to hook up with Harry Marsh. And man, Harry Marsh, thank God I got him before he starts drinking his bourbon tonight. But he's a busy guy, man. He's just, he's just got so many deals in the industry. He's probably doing the most amount of deals out there. I don't know if it's just Charlotte or everywhere else, but all I hear is this guy's name. And I hear good stuff about him. A little nutty, but I hear good stuff about him. So I'm looking forward to learning from these guys, but I want to turn this over and I want to basically uh, let them introduce themselves really quickly, tell you who they are, and then I'm going to go through and I'm going to ask them the questions that everybody has been asking me. I'm going to ask these gentlemen the questions that, that you want to know, and then I'm going to let them respond and they might not agree with each other, which is cool, but they're all in different locations. So we're not on a stage, so they can't beat each other up. There's no boxing gloves here, but I'm gonna start off with Dan. I appreciate you being on. Can you can you introduce yourself and tell the group who you are, what you do and how you got involved? Absolutely, my name is Dan Diaz. My primary market is San Antonio, Texas. Go Spurs, go, I'm a big fan. Uh, this is a great town. It's a relatively stable town. This is Military City, USA. Um, my focus is primarily owner financing. And of course, when it comes to owner financing, uh, a big chunk of it is to acquire property subject to. And we, we do acquire property subject to. I am a proponent. However, I'm also pretty outspoken when it comes to relying or wanting to do subject twos if, if you don't know what's going on, if you're a novice investor. And I put myself as an example because my first deal, like you said, was a subject to. I did net a little over $80,000. It's producing $400 per month. And yet, why am I against it? Well, I did everything wrong with it. I'm married to it. When I went ahead and did the closing, the attorney, and you guys are going to laugh, but literally asked me, so what's the interest rate? I said, I don't know. What's that? And he says, well, what are you going to charge him interest rate? And I said, well, he's going to pay me 400 bucks more than what I'm paying. And he's like, well, yeah, but what's the interest rate? I went to closing without knowing what the interest rate was. And to kick myself in the butt, I had really good credit. So my interest rate was about a 2.65, the one that I had acquired. Oh, by the way, I bought this with my own credit. 
that's how retarded I was. I subject to my own deal. <laughs> and then when we did the math, it turned out to be like a 6.89. I, I mean, that was a smoking interest rate. I didn't know any better. I just knew that I wanted 400 bucks more per month. Well, I love, anyway. I, love, I love the fact that you made all this money and you say, like, I sh you shouldn't be doing it. So we're going to get more into that. And let's move on. I'm going to get more into that. I'm going to dig on that. And you're probably going to have, like, Jeff, Harry, and Don, like, beat you up on what you did and why you shouldn't do it. I know at least it. Jeff and Harry will for sure. Don's, Don's the nice one in the group. He might not. But Jeff is going to smack you around. I'm sure Harry will, like, have some fun with this, too. If he's not already – he i got to send him a bottle of Blandon's bourbon. But um, my next guest is – uh, once again, it's Jeff Richmond. Jeff has an amazing mastermind group, an amazing Facebook group. I'm going to have him share that with you later on. Um, but I, I let Jeff introduce himself. He's from Charlotte, North Carolina. But let him introduce himself, tell you what he's all about, and what he's doing. But Jeff, if you can, once again, thanks for being on. I appreciate you here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've been doing sub two for about 25 years. I do all over the country. So I'm not just set in my market. Last week alone, I did two in Illinois. I'm doing uh, one tomorrow in Texas, one later this week in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So I do all over the country. A couple of weeks ago, I did South Carolina. I love sub two. Uh, you're going to be talking to Harry in just a little bit. He does all my stuff in North and South Carolina. So you can't get any better than him. Wow. Wow. You guys are on. I'm going to make you guys a fight a little bit, though. So maybe, maybe you'll take that back at the end of the episode. I'm going to force it. I'm going to poke the bear until I get you guys to fight. All right. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about oh, everything you're doing, Jeff. But that's like four deals. I'm like, geez, I think I've only done uh, six subject to deals in my whole career of 29 years. And you're doing like four in a week. Harry's probably doing like 200 this week. I'm surprised he's still got color in his hair. Um, <laughs> Don had had before started doing the subject twos, but my next guest, uh, Don DeRosa, I'm going to nickname him the Kita Ninja Real Estate Investor. That is the man. <laughs> <laughs> you guys might not know him. I hope I can say this, but Don is looking great. He literally lost like 100 pounds. So, yeah. man, he's really focused on, on what he does in business and his health. And uh, that's something he's, – he's actually a role model for me in that. So, Don is uh, – Don, I appreciate you being on too. Just give the group a little well, who you are and what well, you do. Thank you. I'll tell you real briefly, I've been doing this business over 20 years, 23 years. Uh, I started, the very first week I started, I put my ad out there and I bought four houses. I'm literally your walking in commercial. I literally bought four houses my first week in this business, wow. all subject to. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but since then I've purchased hundreds of homes subject to, that's my primary focus. Um, I do buy a lot of buy, fix and flips. I don't do a lot of wholesaling, but, um, I've been doing this business for a long time. So, um, but, you know, that's just, I live here in Atlanta, Georgia. So I've been traveling. I've been, I've been educating also. I teach all over the country since 2003 so he's been guys he's been very humble I, I had the benefit I was in Tampa speaking at an event and I had a little extra time before I went to the airport and I was so blown away by by meeting Don and what he's doing and it's very rare that it happens to me where I made my wife and one of my investors come with me right to, to hear him speak and um, I'm not just saying this if you guys get a chance to hear Don speak uh, it's it's an honor to go hear him speak because he really breaks down the subject probably better than anybody else I've ever seen break this down in, in, in a room full of investors. Brand new investors actually walked out of there understanding what he did. See, a lot of times people educate and they just tell you about how great, like I do sell financing. I, I'm a note investor. I buy the distressed debt from the banks. And I, I know when I speak, I speak over people's heads a lot of times. And Don has this innate ability to really bring it down to a basic investor's level so easily even my wife went out there she's like he, my wife said this you could ask her she said Don's one of the best uh speakers i've ever seen because she travels with me a lot to what i do so guys if you have a chance to hear don follow him and just when he's speaking at an event get over there he breaks it down so easily better than ever, anyone i've ever seen break this down and i don't say that lightly and i'm not i'm not going to give out compliments very easily as you can see I'll, I'll beat some of these guys up probably at some point but uh thanks for being on don i appreciate you and you do, you do look awesome, you know. Thank Good you. job. 
And he, if you Thank if you, you want to learn keto, uh, jump in his group. He's a he's a great chef too. He'll give you recipes and everything. So yeah. thank you. And now I got the infamous Harry Marsh. It, Harry is not only an attorney, which he's the only attorney, on, which I love to have an attorney on it. This was what I was looking for. I said, I want the top attorney that does subject to deals. And you know, I had attorneys hit me up and they're like, I would come on your group, but I'd probably ruin it for everybody because I would tell them why they shouldn't do it. Right? Every attorney was telling, two attorneys I knew didn't want to come on a group because they didn't want to ruin it. And I said, that's cool. You can come on here and tell us why we shouldn't do this for whatever reason. But not only is Harry an attorney, but God, all I'm hearing about is he's doing the most deals in an area. He's got more deals than he knows what to do with. So is this a guy who's both an attorney and someone that can, you can get involved with, that can do deals together? That's why he's on this panel. He's, he's the only attorney, after I spoke to a couple other attorneys, that I actually invited on and said, you know what, I want you on here. Because not only are you an attorney, but you're actually, you do subject to yourself. So what better than someone like Harry to get on here? And I appreciate, I know how busy you are. And I appreciate your time. And uh, I would love to, you know, even do a follow-up at one point with all of you guys one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I, I, would, I would love to do a follow-up with you as well and really get deep into this. But thanks so much for being on, Harry. Let people know what, what, what you do and where you're from and what you're about. No problem. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> so we do 200 to 300 closings a month for the week are subject to closings. Uh, I encourage anyone to be doing subject to within the right parameters, but I'm sure we're going to talk about tonight, uh, you know, do everything you can to educate yourself and do it right. But yeah, when I found out about subject to by networking and trying to become involved in real estate, I found out about subject to, I bought 10 or 15 of them myself. It's an amazing way sometimes to leverage your own money and buy more than you could otherwise afford. I try not to buy that many of these days, but sometimes I get these title searches and deals that people can't close and you know, it does happen or I send them to all the other investors that I know in charge. Wow. I love networking that way. Hey, you can. And people love that kind of thing. So I'm looking forward to what we're talking about tonight. That's awesome. Well, I, once again, I thank you guys all for being on. Once again, anyone in the group that's on here, I see we got a bunch of people already live on here. I know a bunch more are going to be signing up. I know a bunch will be watching this at a later time or on a YouTube channel when we post it there. But if you have questions, post them in the comments. I'll be sure to keep an eye on that, and I'll ask the panelists at some point your questions. But I have a ton of my own questions, I want to, and I want to start. I'm going to start with, you know, Don. Um, let's get yep. to the basics on this. You know, what is, without long, you know, education on this, what is a subject to? What does it mean? Um, and why would someone do a subject to deal? Um, okay. The basics of a subject to deal is someone has a motivation. Well, let's start here and without getting too winded. Subject to is the most powerful technique in real estate today. I firmly believe that it comes with a lot of responsibility when you do that, because what you're doing in a subject to transaction is you are literally convincing someone to give you the deed to their home and leave so they give you ownership and then they leave the existing debt in place still in their name. So you get the ownership and then you simply make the payments on their behalf to the bank. And there's a lot of trust across the board. And like I said, there's a lot of, uh, it is the most powerful technique. You can help people tremendously or you can hurt someone tremendously if you're not careful. So why would somebody do that? They simply have no other choice or they have no other, other alternatives or potentially no other alternatives. And that seems to be one of the best solutions for them. So let me, let me ask, uh, let me jump to Harry on this one. Harry, as an attorney, how do you protect a seller from putting them at, you're putting them at crazy risk. So I'm selling a property, I'm, sub, I'm signing the deed over to you guys, and then I'm holding a mortgage in my name. How are you protecting the seller? God forbid you don't pay the mortgage or the mortgage gets called due. But Don is somewhat right. Sometimes it is a last resort for people where they will only do it if they're near a foreclosure or something like that. But to protect the homeowner, we can actually do what's called a wraparound promissory note where it obligates you to make the payment that original homeowner could actually foreclose and take the property back from you so that they have control 
I think if you don't do it that way, there's probably numerous arguments that you can set the whole deal aside for being unfair to the homeowner because they have no recourse. If you do die, disappear, file bankruptcy, uh, you know, life is crazy. A lot of things can happen that, you know, go wrong. So you have to protect the homeowner. And the first thing is just to talk to them. Is this a situation where it's your only resort? Is it something that works for you? Are you getting a fair deal out of it? Or do you want to qualify for another mortgage in two months and, you know, the max amount of money for your family? Okay. If that's their goal, you need to probably be honest with them and ignore them. All right. So, so there is, there's, there's no 100% fail proof way to protect the homeowner. Um, no, Dan, let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. There, unless you give some, unless you put a, a deed in escrow as part of the deal, once you take the property subject to, once you get the deed, you own it and you control that whole thing. And unfortunately, even if you do a wraparound mortgage, they have, the, uh, you know, a true subject to where they convey the deed to you and you don't do a wraparound mortgage where you don't make the payment to them, you make it directly to the bank. You're in control of that whole thing. If you screw that up and you don't make the payments and you're late, you're screwing up their credit. So I need to, you need, we need to be very clear on that because I think it was um, Dan who said that he doesn't necessarily recommend newbies doing this. And I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think a new person can do it. I was proof of it. But I think education goes a long way because you could help someone tremendously or you could destroy them if you're not careful. Well, I appreciate that, Don. And I'm going to like, like a debate. I'm going to go, you mentioned Dan's name and I was going to bring him up anyway. And then I want to get... Yeah, I, I, Dan, I why, why, that real quick. Yeah, why do you say, why, why are you so bold and, and beating down a newbie saying they shouldn't do this, my friend? Just because you got that that hat on, you know. <laughs> well, uh, well you know, I think, on, yeah, I'll yeah. So, so I think I think this would be a good time to to talk about what my definition of newbie is. And my definition of newbie is true: someone who doesn't have experience, but more importantly, someone who did not take the time to truly educate themselves on what it is they're doing, what their moral and legal responsibilities are, and what the possible exit strategies are. So if, if you have taken the, the time to educate yourself and, and really take it upon yourself, especially on the moral side of things, hey, listen, I'm, I'm you know, their credit future is in my hands and I could really damage someone and, and, I'm, and I have the systems in place to, to go ahead and, and, and make it a success. That's a little bit of a different story. I think when it comes to, to newbie people, they, they seem to take, you know, like a 15 minute YouTube video and, and go put a property in a contract. And then, you know, they, they literally don't know what to do with it. So, so when I say newbie, I don't necessarily mean lack of experience. This, this could be a person who's been fixing and flipping for 20 years and they don't have education on, on subject two. They might be a newbie in that sense. So if you've taken the time to educate yourself and especially to, to accept the responsibility associated with it, you know, thumbs up, that's a little bit different. That's not a newbie in, in, in my book. Okay, cool. Well, Jeff, um, I think you're the perfect person to answer this, right? How does somebody getting involved in this business learn the right way to do subject twos? Well, it's just like Dan was saying and Don was saying, education is very important in this. You can't just watch one 15-minute YouTube video and know what you're doing. I've been doing this 25 years and I still don't have all the answers. I don't think anybody on our panel has 100% of the answers. However, we do a pretty good job of it. Uh, I would say to people that want to get into this kind of method doing this work is to team up with somebody, partner up with them, even if you got a small percentage, because something is better than 100% of nothing. And if you do it wrong, you not only hurt the person you're doing it for, you hurt yourself as well and your credibility out there. Cool. So if a, if a newbie, right, Dan, I'm going to say D, Danny D, not me, Dan, um, Dan Diaz. So if a newbie came to you, I know you have a group. How can they get involved with you? Like, how would they come to you? If I, if I was a newbie and I got a deal and I came to you, Jeff or Don or Harry, how, how, how can I come to you and your group and either learn from you or part 
I'm up with you. How would that look? Well, for me, I mean, real estate is simple math. Okay, as long as you can add, subtract, multiply, you rarely use division. Okay, so if you can do fifth grade math, you can do this business. Um, but you would make sure that your numbers work. Now, what sets me apart from a little bit of the other people is they want a lot of equity for the most part in, in properties or cash flow or both. Um, I can do deals that are 100% leveraged and still make money. I just did a deal last week. Uh, it was only worth about 80,000, but he owed a little over 77, bless you. He owed a little over 77 and I'll still make over 55,000 in the next seven years on this house. And it's fully leveraged. So, you know, one of the benefits is teaming up with somebody like Dan D or, or Don or Harry or myself and bringing it to us because we know how to take, you know, lemons and make lemonade. I like that. I like that a lot. Even me, I would feel more comfortable myself um, with all my years of experience being that I've only done about six subject use in my life um, to bring that. And I, that's, I always, I always believe in business, you know, getting, getting a team in place, getting the best guys. And that's why I got you four on here. It's, it's, I would think you're a team that if I brought a subject to deal to you that I need help with, maybe we can do it together and I, I make sure I'm handling it right. And I'm glad to see uh, Danny Maitland jumped on the group because he actually asked the question that I'm going to ask next. So thanks for posting that, Danny, but it's online. Before um, you ask that question, I, I do want to dispel one thing. Sure. Um, something was said a little bit earlier that most people don't have any other way but to get rid of the property and we take it sub two. That's not necessarily true, at least not in my world. 99% of all the deals I've done, people are 100% current and there's no problem. They're not behind on payments or anything. They just want peace of mind and debt relief and know that it's done. But I don't know how that's really peace of, you know, is that really, Harry, is that really peace of mind? That I agree with him to some extent. Sometimes you can get a seller that if you can give them $5,000 more than they can get in a regular sale, they're happy to do a sub two. I don't know if it's peace of mind, but for them, it's a trade-off. They're going to get more money walking away, closing than going through the regular process with a realtor, repairs, all that kind of process. And that may have value enough for them to do it. Okay. I mean, that's, that's fair. Um, one of the questions Danny at Maitland asked, and I, you know, is a good, great guy on our group. Uh, a great investor, somebody I really value a lot. And one of my biggest questions is, what about the due on sale clause? You, you, you're transferring, I'm gonna ask this one to Don. Don, you're transferring the deed to a property, right? How, how is a bank handling that once they find out that the deed transferred, because the mortgage specifically states that you can't transfer a deed without paying them off. How do you guys handle that? Um, into, uh, well, first off, you're assuming, you're assuming, okay. You have to understand the paperwork behind the scenes. Um, you well, tend, I mean, that. we don't we don't tend to just call the bank and say, "Hey, we're taking over this loan." That's not how it works. Most banks, if you understand the the, the banking system, most banks don't want houses. They just want the payment. If you understand how banks work, this really isn't a real. I don't want to say an irrelevant question, but it's it's a question that everybody asks, and people don't understand it. And people assume before they even know, you know, I've done this for 20 some years. I don't know about Jeff. He's done lots of these as well. I don't know, but I don't know how many of the rest of the panel has done, but I've done hundreds of these and I've never once had a loan called due. Now that doesn't mean that one can't be called due or someone hasn't had one called due, but usually my experience when a bank calls it due, my experience anyways, is the person servicing that loan, whoever the seller or whoever the person making the payments has done something wrong, seriously wrong, like not made the payment. <laughs> um, I've, had, I've had sellers call the bank and tell the bank, hey, this guy owns my house. I want this out of my name and I don't want to be responsible for it anymore. And the bank, they don't do it. They haven't done anything. Because banks borrow money from the Federal Reserve at this rate. They lend it out at this rate. 
that difference in between is called a yield spread. You know this better than anybody. Okay. That's how banks make money. They don't make bank. They don't make money by foreclosing on properties. So they've taken a, a bad debt and you've now taken that bad debt, which is on their books in a bad kind of way. And you've improved it and made it current and taken that. And now it becomes an asset as opposed to a liability to a bank. Again, I can't say for certain that a bank's going to call it due or won't call it due, but I can tell you this. I hear this every seminar I've done for the last 20 years, and you just, it's misinformation. Okay, yes, there is a clause in every security instrument that says the bank may at its option call the loan due full and payable if the property transfers hands. But there's a lot of other things behind that you don't see. There's a lot of other verbiage out there. Most people don't realize that it's also in there that says the bank can, you know, let somebody else assume that loan, even if it's not assumable at their option. So most people tend to focus on that. I know that's a big question I got. The other one I got, and and somebody asked Derek Morell, he asked, and that was my next question. And I was going to kind of go to Harry for the paperwork and then go to Jeff and, and Dan, see what they do. But what is the paperwork involved? Like, I, I know you're probably going to talk about power of attorneys. And then I really want to get into like somebody answering about the insurance issue. But Harry, as an attorney, what paperwork should be involved for a subject to deal? As an attorney, what do you, what do you require or what do you recommend that your buyers have when they do subject to use? I'll go through a couple of our standard forms. Everything starts with a contract. But then when at the closing table, which we treat just like a normal closing, it'll be a subject to. closing. At that time, we'll get an authorization letter that would add you to their account. We'll get a limited power of attorney for the property just for that property so that you could do anything you may want with it. For example, changing over homeowner's insurance, although you rarely even need it, but we get it just to be safe. We get an assignment of the escrow account so that you become the person that owns their property taxes and insurance if there's an escrow in it. So that that check isn't sent back to them someday in the future, or if it is, you can cash it. Um, we got literally what I call a cover your ass letter, which outlines what that person is doing. And I even label it that you understand that we're not paying off your loan. You're understanding that what is happening here. And I'm on that. Then you've got that promissory note, the wraparound mortgage, all the typical documents you would have for, you know, a wraparound mortgage. But yeah, there's probably eight more documents than a typical closing. It feels like a really proper closing that's procedural you know, so that everyone knows that this is a very formal thing that they need to pay attention to. Cool. Are you doing this just in North Carolina or are you, you're helping people out nationwide do subject to We do so- South Carolina as well. Okay. So North Carolina sub- and South Carolina. Cool. Um, Another question here, I'm going to ask this to Jeff. Um, what are your thoughts on title insurance versus no title insurance? Uh, Derek Mel asked, my last subject too, I didn't get title insurance because I was only 6 k out of pocket and did my own due diligence. So there wasn't much to insure the title company won't insure the mortgage. So I'll be paying about 1500 to secure 6 k Is Do you guys do title insurance on your, on your deals? I would say sometimes. If I have a lot of equity and it's an older loan, I do a title search. Otherwise, I do a title check. If there's not a lot of equity and the loan's not that old, uh, I don't really have anything to risk. Most people pay me to take a house. So it's not the other way around. Um, With that said, I don't spend the money. You know, I might call an attorney like Harry and say, hey, can check this title and let me know what you think. And pretty much if he says, hey, it looks clean, I'll go ahead and close it. If it doesn't look clean, then I might pay for a title, a title search. And how do you do that? Now you're buying all over the US. How do you find right. your attorneys and other markets that understand? Because from what I, what I understand is that subject to is this nuance that a lot of attorneys that aren't like Harry that don't understand they don't, they don't get involved in because they, you know, they'll talk their clients out of it. Well, um, that's just it. You, you have to find attorneys that understand that are investor friendly. So to start with, you go to your local RIA in whatever town you're in and you find out the attorneys that are involved in that RIA and you just say to them, hey, do you know about subject to deals? 
And if they hesitate or they don't know what it is, I, I end the conversation immediately. I don't waste my time. You know, I'm about, not there to educate them. Right. And what about when you're buying in another market? How do you handle that? Well, the exact same way. I, I find out in the local RIA where I'm at, and I find an attorney that is investor friendly that understands about sub twos. If they don't, then I find another one. And I just keep calling to until I find one. That's that's yeah, awesome. I have Dan, I have a quick story about that. I was driving back from Florida from visiting uh, the Tampa Ria. Uh-huh. And I, you know, I have students all over the country that buy that that buy subject to. And every so often, somebody calls me and says, hey, I bought your material. And my attorney says, it doesn't work in my state. <laughs> right. So I was coming back. So I almost always have to call the attorney. You'd be surprised how many times I call the attorney and educate them. But it was funny. I was driving back from Florida. And even in my own state, you know, I tell people, look, you know, they ask me for advice. I say, get yourself a good attorney that knows what they're doing when it comes to this. Well, I got a phone call from a coaching student of mine and he's like, Don, we're at a closing table and this attorney doesn't says we can't use this because we, I teach a lot of uh, folks to put it into a trust. Right. Okay. And he goes, he doesn't know how to use a trust. So I had to spend 45 minutes teaching him how to do a trust and then he had to call around and ask all the other attorneys that he knew if he if I was correct. <laughs> Did you send him an invoice for your? I should have. I should have. Well, I would just I tell you just, just refer more. You get, you get a promissory note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not Harry's all attorneys. Harry's very not all attorneys are, you to Yeah, not all attorneys are created. No, it's, well, Harry would tell you that too. Half the attorneys he talks who don't know what the hell they're doing. Well, that's why. Yeah, we get one a week transferred from another attorney to us for those probably have no idea what's going on. Yeah, well, that's why it's so important. And that's why I asked Harry to be on here, because as an attorney, um, where I've run into, where I've, see, where I've seen a lot of people have issues, is they go to their attorneys, and their attorneys tell them it's illegal, you can't do it. And I want, rather than us saying it, I want to have an attorney on here telling you how to do it the right way to protect the seller. We always got to look to protect the seller's interest, right? You're about making money, but let's protect the seller, make sure that they're safe and taken care of and you'll make money. But um, now we're talking about, we're going to get more into what's involved in the subject too. But, you know, Dan, I want to get to you, right? I know these other guys, what they're doing, but you know, you still will do a subject to here and there. So tell me what your criteria, what is a good subject to deal for you? When you look at a deal, what's the deal you say, boom, this is a subject to type deal. Yeah. So um, I, I've got a, a pretty narrow list of, of what I'll do for a subject to. Um, I know that you can pay more and you can take them down without equity. Um, I will do that if they're current, um, you know, like, like Jeffrey kind of talked about it. Um, but my general criteria is I still do want 20% equity in the transaction. I do want to make sure that uh, the difference between the unpaid principal balance and uh, the current ARV is, is uh, mine is the repairs. It still gives me about a 20% um, equity margin. Uh, I look for a national lender. I look for the interest rate to be no more than 6% fixed. I make sure there are no arms in, in, uh, in, in that transaction. Um, so, so that's generally you know, the, the, the criteria that um, I do look for. Um, the second criteria that I, I will consider, and, and this is probably more along the lines of, of Jeff's, is we're, we're Military City USA. And, and by the way, for all you guys, if, if y'all want to come to San Antonio and just market the heck out of it, um, th there's a really, really good market for subject twos where it's military folks. These are VA loans. These are a 2.75% interest, 3%, 3.15% interest. And they get their orders and they're leaving. And they're not behind on payments. These are beautiful homes. These are new homes. These are homes that, you know, will easily fit the 1%. Uh, I'm not a landlord person, but they will fit the 1% mark that a lot of buy and hold people look for. Um, so, so if it's not behind, if it's a pretty home, if, if I'm not going to do anything to it, um, you know, then, then that'll be the, the exception to, to my um, equity rule. So that's, that's kind of what I look for in a, in a subject too. Well, that's great. What about Jeff? What about you? What is, what, what's a good subject to deal? Or what do you look for? Well, 
first of all, it, I would say my hat's off to you, obviously, Dan, <laughs> Dandy, because I do a lot of stuff with the military. Uh, I come from a huge military family. Um, I've written special reports on VAs because I go after vets uh, to help them because a lot of people don't help them, okay? Um, but for me, you know, I like higher price houses. Uh, I prefer homes that are usually 200,000 to 550. That's typically what I go after. I don't always get them. I will do the lower end scale. Um, they don't have to have a lot of equity. For me, the numbers just have to make sense. So there's got to be some type of cash flow. If I don't have much in the way of cash flow, then they, the seller, has to pay me the difference. So if I don't get at least 200, 250 a month cash flow, the seller pays me the 200, 250 a month. Okay. Well, how do they pay you? Let me, let me, let me get into that. Cause that's interesting. I don't want to, I hate to interrupt, but I want to, okay. also, I go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you figure out, okay, it's, let's say you want 250 a month and let's say the cash flow is a hundred dollars a month. I know how you do this, but I want the audience to hear from you how you do this. Well, how do you I'm, figure out how much they should pay you or can pay you? Well, it, it's a couple things. Number one, you have to look at your numbers and say, okay, I want to make this much money off of the property. If I don't make this much money, you have to sign and notarize a promissory note that you know, you're know you going to pay me X amount of dollars a month. Now, I'll give you a for instance. Um, a few years ago, I did one in an area not that far from me, actually, uh, probably 30 minutes. So I make about 800 a month on this house. Well, the seller in, in the title check, we found what, what I call a disappearing loan. It's a North Carolina Housing Authority loan. So if you have a housing authority loan, you have to keep it a certain amount of time. And then once you've lived in the house for a while, it disappears about 20% a year until nothing is owed, okay? So that's a housing authority loan. That's what I call a disappearing loan. Well, this guy had one and he forgot that he had this loan because he wasn't making any payments. So I did some figuring, even though it was disappearing, I was making him pay me $400 a month for the loan. So for two years, he had paid me 400 a month. Then he filed bankruptcy and that 400 a month stopped because he included that debt. He couldn't include the house in a bankruptcy Sneaky. because of how he took title. Mm -hmm. What's that? Sneaky. Damn. <laughs> and you like that hey, I, I was making good money on that house. Now I, now, I, I, mean, money, I, yeah. I was making great money. Now I make good money on the house. I don't make so great you, money. So you had, Harry, answer on, uh, on this one. So he had a promissory you know, for $400 a month. What happens if they don't pay? What, what can you do? What, as an attorney, what would you do on that? I don't, like mess with, <clears throat> I don't mess with the government. I would not do anything with NC Housing Lane or HUD or Secretary of Defense or anything like that. Jeff is a little more aggressive than I am. I very rarely, like Don said earlier, ever see any of these called due. NC Housing is one of them that will call due. Like Don was saying earlier, usually there's no bank out there paying attention which property has been sold, which one has been transferred. There's no department checking on people. NC Housing is one where they actually are checking on people and they're kind of unfriendly when, you, when they do that. So advice for a newbie that we were talking about earlier, my advice would be not to touch anything with the government involved for your first couple of loans. And also don't wholesale anything subject to, you know, buy them for yes. yourself. So Agreed. you don't have to worry about. Wait, wait, wait. I got, I got, hold Agreed. on. I love it. I got Agreed. three heads shaking and I got Jeff Richmond back there probably saying BS. No, I, no, I, I will not wholesale the sub two. I am really definitely against it. Yeah, I agree. Never uh, hold us up to. Well, uh, think about it for a minute, Dan. Uh, think about go, it. Okay? Go, go for each one. Why not? If, if I'm sub a deal from you, let's say you have a house, and uh -huh. I'll take it sub two, you and I have built what? A rapport. Oh, yeah. Right. We built a rapport. We built trust. I'm going to sell this trust to somebody I don't know they can make the payment, so we can make $3,000, or I can make $3,000. I'm going to sell your trust for three to five grand to somebody I don't know if he can make the payments for your house. 
when I made that deal with you, no, I won't do it. So I got you guys all on board that not one of you would, would wholesale a sub two deal. Don shaking his head. No, no, no. no. I can tell, I can tell you, I can tell you that wholesaling a subject two is very dangerous. Extremely. Because, because think about it. And Jeff, Jeff hit it right on the head. You you sit down with, you sit down with the seller. You, they trust you. They say, okay, fine. I'm on board. And then all of a sudden, because remember, here's the way I look at it. And I'm sure all of you guys look at it the same way. I don't look at a subject to deal where I'm going to buy it and then not make the payments and use it as, I mean, I was in a seminar one time and a guy said, I buy a house subject to, I let the homeowner stay in it. And then I know darn well, they're not going to, they're not going to make the payments. So I evict them at that point. Well, oh my in my God. opinion, that is the absolute where I actually told him to leave my seminar. I said, that is not the message you need to be. Subject to is a financial tool only. It is, the, it is what you will use. I mean, you can control an enormous amount of real estate for a very little dollar amount because you're using someone else's financing. If, that's, if, they're, if you're buying it for any other reason, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Well, the only difference... The only difference I have to that, Don, would be that if I was a fix and flipper, and I'm not, I I don't do that. I I will wholesale the deal if it's not livable because I'm not very good at fix and flipping. But I've taught some of my friends that do fix and flip like 40, 50 a year on the higher dollar uh, houses that if they buy the house sub to for say, 300,000 and it needs 40,000 in work. Well, you can step in that house and just spend the 40,000 in work in, you know, $2,000 a month, as opposed to spending 340,000. Oh, that. I do the exact same thing. Okay. I do and the exact same flip thing. flip it like 90 yeah. days later. So yeah, yeah I do the know, exact same that, thing. That I, I would condone, but to yeah, wholesale yeah, yeah. the sub two that you're going to keep, no, never. Guys, yeah, I, because I, what you're doing, yeah, I agree 100%. I agree 100% with you. Uh, I do that all the time. I take over something subject to, I use private financing to put a second on the on the property to do the fix up cost and then I sell it. Because for me, I can get in for very little money. I can control four or $500,000 houses mm-hmm. uh, for very little money. But my point is when they sit to, across from you and they trust you and they say, okay, I know you're gonna make my payment. And then you turn around and you go, okay, for five thousand dollars, for ten thousand dollars, I'm going to give you this deal, and then what happens is they don't fulfill their obligation. That seller is going to either a put you on the six o'clock news, or they're going to sue, and they're not going to sue the person who didn't make the payment. They're going to sue you, and then you're going to say, "Well, I don't own it anymore," and then you're going to get on the six o'clock news, and all it's just not worth doing that. You know. Just, Hey, Dan, Dan, I've got a question for the other panelists just to kind of get a, a feedback. Sure, what sure. is the exit strategy that you guys most often use when you when you buy subject to? Because subject to is just the acquisition. But, but I was just going to ask. That? I was going to talk about that because I know we've talked. Don has mentioned Sorry. flipping. No, that was great. That was great. You're going there. I love it. Bring it up. And some people are asking that kind of stuff, too. But, you know, I know Jeff is probably into it for rentals. I would be into it for more rentals. Sounds nope. like Don is probably in there to get the property cheap and kind of flip it. I hate, yeah. I abhor rentals. Um, you know, think about it. When you rent a home, you have to take a deposit. You ha- you're supposed to legally keep it separate and then give it back. Plus, when something breaks, you have to fix it. A, I don't like giving money back and I don't like fixing anything. <laughs> so I do, my exit strategy is 100% rent to own lease option, just the price points, the same thing, or I'll do owner financing it out. I, I will not do a rental. Well, let's uh, talk about, let, let me stop you there again, because yeah. you said owner financing, lease option, rent to own. Are you having these borrowers underwritten by a RMLO, which is a, lo- a loan officer, to meet Dodd-Frank and CFPB guidelines when you do that? For the owner finance, I do. For the rent to own, I just do a DTI, a debt to income analysis. Okay. I just make sure I, I pull up their credit, I pull up all their bills, have them fill some paperwork out, and I look at it. 
And then I go by the percentages and we're allowed to go at a higher percentage. So I'll, I'll go with the cost of housing and all their costs about 35 max 37 and a half percent of their income. Okay. That's that's income ratio. So um, I know people are going to get a little blown away when we start talking about that. That's why I wanted to stop and, and mention that guys, if ju just, I'm going to go back into questions, but I just wanted to mention if you owner, if you sell a finance, anything to an owner, you got to make sure they are qualified with their debt to income ratio. That's the Dodd-Frank. You can look up Dodd-Frank rules and regulations. Um, Harry, do you have anything on Dodd-Frank or CFPB? Do you handle owner occupant, owner occupant sell of financing? Yeah, not, I tell Jeff not to do those all the time. And he's still does them. Uh, <laughs> so as his uh, attorney, he's not listening to you. <laughs> and I won't do that for other people. I think that's wholesaling a subject to deal. You're letting someone else, you know, step into the deal that you've got subject to, and now you've got a primary occupant in the house. Good luck evicting them. Like Don said, you're going to end up on the news at some point. Yeah. Where that person doesn't want to leave the house, they're not making your payments anymore. You can't evict them because they haven't. And then you've got an original owner that's looking to you for the payments. I stay away from that and make Jeff do his own hip work or maybe give him blank forms for that. Oh, I love that. So Jeff, how do you how do you protect yourself if, if the person you're solo financing it to doesn't make payments? Then I make the payment, and and that's the thing that Dan D was talking about earlier is for the the novice investor regarding sub two. You could you could have done a hundred fix and flips, but if you've never done a sub two, I would never attempt to do it on your own. And basically, you go with somebody that does it. And so. basically, from what it sounds like, from what Harry's telling you, as the attorney, as your attorney, who you don't listen to, who he's saying, right? I tell him that um, if you're going to turn around and have a seller, uh, an, uh, an occupant, owner occupant, jump in that property, you have to at least make sure that you can cover those payments until a foreclosure and eviction, which takes how long in North Carolina, Harry? It could be up to two years. I mean, I think Jeff knows that. So he gets a substantial deposit down. So if he does have to wait that out, you know, you've got the money to cover yourself. So again, if I, I just, kind of just jump in, if, uh, if you guys, and I'm, I'm giving you guys carte blanche, if you want, you know, someone in San Antonio, not only is the market really good, but we're a non-judicial state. You can foreclose in as little as 41 days and it'll cost you $950. And that's the conversation that I do have with my owner finance buyers. I let them know how quickly and how easily I can foreclose on them if need be. The second thing that I do with them is uh, I take them on a little field trip on the first Tuesday of the month. I invite them to lunch. Little do they know that it's at 100 Dolorosa across the street where uh, the foreclosures are happening. So I let them know that every first Tuesday of the month, we call it Texas Tuesday, anywhere between four to 500 people in our county are getting foreclosed. And I tell them, don't ever be this person. Right now, our foreclosure rate is under 1%. And I think it's partly because of that. Right. Well, that that's, that's really interesting. That is, so Don, um, you, yours, you're done subject twos. What is your strategy on your subject twos? Because I think I, I do got everything. now. I think I, I do everything. Dance. I do everything. I do everything. I will rent. I will owner finance. You know, I'm going to say the same thing that you know, our state's a non-judicial state as well in Georgia. 60 days and they're out. So the only, the only caveat would be if somebody, what's that? You guys are lucky. <laughs> yeah. So the only caveat to that is if obviously somebody files bankruptcy, um, that can delay it. But yes, I mean, I'll, I'll rent something. I look at the numbers. I look at what my exit strategy, what my entrance and what my exit is, how much is it going to cost me to get in? You know, what is my exit strategy? Like, for example, if I'm going to rent a subject to, the person, the seller, can't be someone that is got perfect credit and they just, for whatever reason, that moment in time, they had to get out from under it. And you know, five years down the road, they want to buy a new home because that may not happen for them. So if I, you know, usually the houses that I will, what I call rent, and I own them and I just hold on to them forever, I tell the seller. I have no idea when, because that's one of the questions they ask me, how long is the loan going to stay in my name? Forever. And my answer is, my answer is, I don't know. I don't have that crystal ball. If I, you know, 
but if it's forever and if I have this three bedroom brick ranch that I love and I don't ever want to get rid of, I will literally tell them, I don't know. I may never get it out of your name. And by telling them that, do I lose some deals? Absolutely. Well, not, not really. I just changed the way I buy, but generally speaking, I'm very honest and upfront with them. And cause I don't want anybody. When I first started this many years ago, I think the very first person I told, they like, well, how long is the loan going to stay in my name? I said, Oh, you know, about a year. Oh my God. 12 months in a day, they were banging <laughs> on my door going, okay, you said a year. I'm like, yeah, but you know, I was, I mean, it just was a nightmare. So I don't tell people that anymore. I don't tell, I say, I don't have that crystal ball, but I don't make any money until this thing sells. So I want to get them out of, got it, get it out of your name as quickly as possible. Well, yeah, I go, I go along with Don. Um, my part of my buying criteria is under no circumstances uh, will, will I ever give the promise that it will be anything under forever. So, and if they're going to do the deal, that's because they fully understand. And of course, you know, that's where the sales lingo kind of comes into play is I, I let them know, Hey, listen, your credit's, you know, bad right now because you haven't made your, your mortgage payment. How do you think your credit is going to benefit when all of a sudden the bank starts getting, you know, your reinstatement check and, and your monthly mortgage payment, that's going to help your credit. So, so you're going to continue getting this help for the next 30 years, you know? Um, and I'm honest and upfront and I tell them you, you may be able to buy a home later on. You, you, you might not. I mean, that's just the truth. And if, and if the deal lingers on that, that then we, we might not have a deal. And I'm okay with that. Yep, me too. Yeah, well, how do we, guys, how, well, Jeff, let me ask you this. Yeah. How do you handle, okay, so they have homeowner's insurance, right? You want homeowner's insurance in your name. I know if you can't, they cancel the homeowner's insurance. As a, as a bank myself, where I do sell the financing, I get notified of any change on insurance. How do you handle that situation? where you're covered in homeowner's insurance mm -hmm. and the bank not be notified or not to protect it, it, yourself. And I mean, I, I use, you know, I've been lucky enough that I use somebody that understands and knows sub two in the insurance world. Um, but what I wind up doing is the lien holder, the underlying lien holder or bank that has the mortgage or note against the property they have to be first, okay? So they get paid first. I take properties like Don teaches people in trust. All my properties are in trust. So the trust is second. Then I put the original homeowner's name on the policy, it's called a TEMA, as their interest may appear. Because that $7.50 an hour employee at the bank is going to freak out and flag the file that I found, if they don't see their name on the insurance policy, that's where problems could start to occur. So I put them on in third position at TEMA and take it from there. And I've never had a problem. I just did, um, I think I did a insurance check uh, last week on a property I have in Alabama because a tree fell on a roof ripped a hole in the roof in a gutter. I put a whole new roof on gutter system. They sent a check to my trust uh, and I deposited and, and, and paid the company and they went and removed the tree, put, put the whole roof on and everything. I didn't have any problems. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's a big question is the insurance, but it's funny, uh, Alice Adams just jumped in and asked the question I was just about to ask. So thanks for posting that Alice. And I'm going to ask this, <clears throat> let's ask this to Don and then, uh, you know, Don knows about it. He'll know this stuff. Um, what happens with the buyer, right? The seller that, that signed the deed over to you, they turn around and eventually they might want to buy another property. How are they going to be approved with that mortgage on their credit? They may not. <laughs> I love Dan's answer. I don't know. <laughs> they may not. They may not. <laughs> they may not. I mean, it all depends on them because, I mean, think about it. They may, I mean, right now, someone could have multiple properties and their credit, you know, it, it depends on, you know, what down payment they have, their credit worthiness, the, I mean, their whole financial picture, right? So if somebody is behind on payments, for example, and they're ready to file bankruptcy and I step in and I rescue the property from foreclosure, whatever, 
yeah, the chances of them getting a new loan to buy a new house in the next few years is slim. Just from, you know, I'm not saying that they can't go get credit repair and fix it in the whole nine yards. But, uh, you know, when people ask me that and they say, well, when can I go get a new loan? Well, if you sell it to me and I assume, or uh, not assume, if I take over that property, that if I can, if I take over the, the deed, you may not be able to because your credit may not allow you to qualify. So if you're going to go, and that's one of the first questions I ask them is, you know, what's your exit strategy? Where are you going to, what are you going to do? Are you going to go rent or are you going to go try to buy something new? If they're going to go try to buy something new, I tell them that may be a problem for you because if you let me, if you convey the deed to me, you may not be able to, your credit worthiness may not allow you. Now, Harry, you right run into this lot too. If they're, that's, that's a great, and, and what I love about you, Don, is you're just, you're so ethical when you deal with people. You're not, well, you're, you're not willing to take a deal just to make a dollar unless you're taking care of your seller. And that's, that's what I love about what you're doing. So I appreciate you, what you're doing, um, because anyone that's doing business the right way, I appreciate, you know, don't chase money. Uh, money will follow. But Harry, um, on something like that, though, have you ever had somebody come, because you're doing a ton of these as well. Have you ever somebody come back to you? And I know you said you don't just deal with people with bad credit um, or people that are late on their mortgages. Um, do they take any of that payment that you're making and use that towards their, are they able to use that towards their future mortgage? Exactly. More and more, a lot of the mortgage companies consider that. Sometimes they'll want you to document a written leaf where you're making their payment for them and they'll consider that rental income for them. So instead of them making that $800 monthly payment for their mortgage, they're receiving that to kind of offset that obligation and help them qualify for another loan. So far, out of all these couple people come back two years later and want another house. And with that rental history, it's like a rental history to the lender, they've been able to qualify them for another loan. And, and that's great. I just wanted you to say that because one of the six subject twos I did, I had that situation happen, guys. And I had to like show them uh, cancel checks that I made the mortgage payment for them. So that's one thing. Um, now the other thing, Dan, I, I, I know you probably, all you guys probably ran into this. I would love to hear you handle it. One of my concerns back then when I started, and I'm sure other people, I haven't seen the question come up yet in the group, but I'm sure people, if they haven't thought about it, they should be thinking about it. Like, geez, I'm making these payments for you. You're going to get the mortgage interest statement at the end of the year. How am I getting credit for those payments? Or how are you not taking credit for the mortgage interest that I'm paying? So, you know, that's the question for your CPA. And that's really, really the best way for me to, um, to answer it. The loan is in your name. And there's no reason why, you know, you wouldn't be able to take, um, you know, those interest payments, um, you know, in, in, in your name. But that, that, that answer for me is answered by my CPA and, and your CPA will have to answer that question. Nobody's really asked me that question. I suppose it's a, it's a good, good and valid question. I, I, I want the mortgage interest right off. I'm making those payments. I don't want to give it to them. I have to the payment. If, if I'm there's making actually, the payment. There's actually an IRS regulation, whoever makes the payment and not whose name it's in. Right. But how do you prove that? Because they're going to get the mortgage well, interest. You have to understand, we, we own the property. They right. own the loan, we own the home. Whoever owns the home is the one that gets to take the mortgage interest deduction. We're making the payment to the bank for the homeowner. In the homeowner's name, it doesn't matter. The IRS states, we get the mortgage interest deduction. If they try to do it, that's fraud on their part. So how do you, how do you set that up, Harry? How do you set that up in the beginning that they know they, they, they're not taking that mortgage interest payment, because they might get the mortgage interest statement if the address still comes to them. I'm sure you yeah. change the address to your address. You change it right away. Yeah. Exactly, and you're talking about documents we have for the closing to do this. One of those documents is an assignment of their 1098 deduction. So you talk about that at the closing table. Hey, after today, you cannot make this you know, deduction for anything before that period, sure. Yeah. It, but you know, going forward, do not bring it on the same property. Well, that's that's I mean, that's something real. You know, I think we've touched on a lot of important things the do on sale clause, we've touched on the insurance, we've touched on protecting them with the whole. I'm, I'm glad you guys said this you don't wholesale 
Um, so because I see this all the time. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because I see it and it makes me cringe when I see people out there wholesaling subject to deals, because right away, I always think about the seller and how we, my biggest thing is always protecting investors and protecting sellers and how we protect those, those people. But I, I want, I want to, I appreciate you guys all saying that because I was hoping that nobody really wholesale subject to is unless you do it in a way like Jeff's doing, but Jeff, Jeff's not really doing that, but he's, he's putting people in there, but he knows he can make those payments. So he's at least doing yep. this in a situation where he can make those payments. God forbid something should happen. He's covering the payments himself. So he's really taking care of the sellers and I hats off to Jeff for doing that and teaching his students that and teaching that in his group. So that's awesome. But you know, we're all talking about subject to it mortgages, but I, I know Harry's out there doing some really ninja stuff on this. And, and, and I just wanted to give something out there. Um, I know you're just not doing subject twos on mortgages, right, Harry? You're doing some other kinds of subject to stuff. Correct. <clears throat> we love doing subject twos on judgments and other lanes. They're sometimes the more exciting stuff. There's plenty of people out there with a $200,000 IRS lien against their property. And for that reason, they can't sell the property, but they can still sell it subject to. And the exciting thing about a lien or a judgment like that is that it can expire. So instead of a 45 year maturation date on a mortgage or something, you have a 10 year uh, expiration on a judgment and the judgment may already be eight years old. So in two years, your $100,000 IRS lien expires if you got the property could do nothing else with the property a great way to make money so now on a hundred thousand dollar IRS lien walk me through how you would buy that deal what how much would you offer how do you do that deal what's the mathematics on that deal um, when it comes to maturity and that lien falls off how do you get that lien off stuff like that you don't have to do anything they automatically expire after 10 years we've never seen the IRS renew a judgment or anything like that uh, it's almost impossible for anyone to renew a judgment, in fact, in North Carolina, at least. So it might depend on that particular state. But around here, you just uh, factor in your cash flow or your, you know, what you're eight year expiration on it versus two year expiration would be a completely different story. You value it how you would any other bill. Well, that's pretty, I mean, that is ridiculous how good that is. I'm just, my, my wheels, everyone's wheels should be spinning. Don, Don, have you done that before? I've done uh, IRS liens like that. Sure. Um, not much else. Not no. much else. Mm -mm. Wow. Wow. That's no, but I'll take over a pro I'll take yeah. over a property subject to when it has it's so for me, it, it, it can be over leveraged. I bought one, you know, a little while back that was completely over leveraged, but their payment, they were, you know, it's a 30 year loan. Their payment was break even but they were uh, 25 years into this loan. And, you know, so I'll take a property that, you know, I've bought houses that I've had to pay $400 a month ad additional because I couldn't get that much in rent, but because of the underlying financing it, and the loan was so old that it was like a, I, I treated like a 401k. So, you know, for every $400 I put in, I'm getting $800 in equity behind the scenes. So Jeff, you really Jeff, just need to know your numbers. Jeff's probably shaking. Jeff would probably be like, I'm going to find out a way to have this guy or gal pay me $30,000 and take over this loan for the next five years. Right, Jeff? Hey, I, I just did a deal in Illinois last week. The guy gave me his house and he paid me over $8,000. Talk about that deal real quick, if you don't mind. Well, the, the guy bought the house with his son. Uh, the last tenants trashed it. It was still very livable. Um, the son lived three hours away. He lived around the corner from the house. You know, he's an older guy. He didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I ran the numbers. He owed, what, 37 It was worth maybe 42 5 or something like that. And I said, look. I can help you out, but you're going to have to make the payments through December and pay me $8,000. I've taken, I've taken deals, you know, also, also subject to where the, the seller pays me again, I've got, and this is just my, my personal thing. Um, I need a 20% equity position on the transaction. So when I do the math for the, for the sellers, let's say they're, you know, $8,000 short, 
I just let them know, you know, what's your plan for paying that? You know, you can buy down the equity if you'd like. And, and sometimes, you know, they, they, they got money. Um, I, they have written a check. Lots of times it's just payment plans. You know, I'll just tell them, okay, how much can you pay per month? 200 bucks, 300 bucks. I won't charge you any interest. We'll just do payments for the next three years. But, but I let them know that, 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 that is to purchase down the equity position that I need to do in order to do the transaction and they'll do it. Yeah. I'm the same way. Um, I make a, I have a margin. I have a walk away point. I look at three numbers on whenever I do any deal. I look at what my net profit is. I look at what my return is and then my loan to value ratio. And all three of those have to hit a certain margin for me. And if two out of the three hit, I usually will go to the seller and say, okay, I can't buy this unless I get X. And if you can sell it to me and bring five grand, 10 grand, I've had a guy just recently bring 25 grand to the table. Um, and the problem with most new investors is they don't ask. True. I agree. Now here, here's something, here's something funny I'd like to share because I just did this deal. So the subject to numbers and the wholesale numbers were almost identical. It was about a $5,000 difference between my, my wholesale offer and the, um, and, the, uh, and the unpaid principal balance. So for whatever reason, they were super fearful. I was excited to get it you know, subject to because I'd be getting it right around 66% of ARV minus repairs. Uh, my wholesale offer is 65% of ARV minus repairs. And um, they ended up bringing to the table $7,000 in order for me not to take it subject to and, and actually close on a wholesale number. So, you know, hey, I'm okay with that too. All right, good. Yeah. So is there, is there a minimum? I know, I know, you know, Alice had asked what margins you guys look for. Is there a minimum you guys look for in your deals? Harry, is there a minimum you look for? And then go that line real quick. Depends on your exit strategy. I'll do an Airbnb every once in a while if there's not very good cash flow to kind of help that cash flow. But just completely depends on the deal. Okay. What about you, Don? Do you have a you have a couple yep. strategies? Is there a minimum? Yep. Um, I look for three numbers. My minimum profit on any deal is twenty grand, which my average profit's forty grand. That's what I pretty much average. Um, but my minimum my walk away is 20 grand. If I'm not making 20 grand, I'm not getting a 20, a greater than a 25% return or a loan to value ratio that's 70%, I'm out. Unless, unless I'll take something that's over leveraged if I can make 400, 450 a month cash flow. Okay. So if I can make 400, $500 a month cash flow, I'll take something that's over leveraged. But when I do that, they know right up front they're, the end is nowhere near in sight for them getting this out of their name. <laughs> so, that's me. That's that's great. What about you, Jeff? What do you look? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff's oh. got some crazy margins, I think. For me, it, it all comes down to the numbers. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have equity because when you rent to own or owner finance a house, and Dandy, I think you'd agree with me. Um, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar house. Well, if he owes ninety thousand dollars, I mean, we can own or finance or rent own that house all day long at one hundred nine nine or one hundred and ten. Um, I just had a guy recently. Uh, I took a house a little bit, not that far from me. Uh, it's about, eh, it was worth two fifteen last year. The guy just let me know that uh, he's not exercising the option when you're into it. So when he moves out, uh, you know, and the value went up to, I think, 240. So I'll put it out there at 253.9. I like odd numbers. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you create equity out of no equity is what you can do. So going back to this $100,000 house, you can take a house up to it 95. You know, my margins are less than a lot of the other guys on the panel. I'm a little more aggressive. Um, but you can put that house out at, you know, 1099, 1139, something like that, and create equity 
and see if the person's going to buy it or not. You know, you can stop raising that level when you start getting a lot of pushback. Yeah. Okay. Great. Dan, what about you? What do you look for? What's your minimum margins that you look for on a deal? Um, I will not, I will not be more than 10% of the ARV cash out of pocket, whether it's in repair, reinstatements, um, or, or anything of that nature. I also need a 20% equity position. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it, it depends. Like, for example, I just took this deal, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, very similar to, you know, what, what, Jeff, what Jeff was talking about. Um, the unpaid principal balance was about 191. The ARV was about 200,000. Uh, so, so obviously, you know, there, there was no equity there, um, but it was a 2.9% fixed for 30 years. Wow. Um, so, you know, when, when I went ahead and uh, sold it on, on owner financing, I went ahead and owner financed it at, at 8% and it created a $625 spread or so. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll do those, those deals, you know, um, all day where I'm minimal out of, out of pocket, but you know, like everyone commented, you have your own personal, you know, criteria um, that, that works for you. It's your comfort level. I know what I'm going to do with them if, if you know, um, I need to figure out an exit strategy and, and uh, you know, every deal is, uh, is a little bit different. Th that one that I took down, it was in immaculate condition. It was seven years old. It was a military family. They were super grateful because, you know, they, they, their thing was, they, they didn't have the money to, you know, put it on, on the market and, and they'd have to come up with, you know, 14, 15, $18,000 uh, to do that. They didn't need a new home because he was getting deployed and he was going to be on base for at least five years elsewhere. So it just worked, worked really great for them. And the home was gorgeous. I mean, literally when I, when I walked it, I, I was, I was blown away. I mean, I, I, I had my, my um, uh, lady that cleans the houses go through it she cleaned it in like three hours and we listed that afternoon on the MLS. So, I mean, it's, it was, it was an absolutely gorgeous home. That's great. Hey guys, real quick. Have you ever dealt with, has anyone ever dealt with uh, removing PMI on a subject to deal? Well, VA loans don't have subject to deals. That's why Dan does so much in his area, because when you deal with a VA loan, there is no PMI. Um, typically I have found to remove PMI, you have to have a minimum of 20% equity into the house. And some of them are a little bit more. And now some of the banks are telling me to remove it. The payments also have to be made concurrently for at least four or five months. And there can't be any issues. Oh, I think that's okay. right. Has anybody else had that issue? I haven't uh, had I, it in a I've long had a time. Of, yeah. Go ahead. Harry. I haven't had it in a long time. Yeah, have you had to do that, Harry, or no? I haven't had to do it. I would tell people just to leave it up to the bank when it goes away at 20% equity, not stir that up with the bank and try to get involved. But haven't had anyone try. Okay. So, so you know, I think video has, has been a little stagnant on Facebook. So, but we, anyone that hears this, this is being recorded. So we'll put it out there so everyone's going to get everything. But it's, I think Facebook is having a little issue. It's going in and out. But uh, real quick, Harry, and then I'm going to get in. I'm going to finalize it. But, you know, we've talked about, you know, notes being called due and stuff like that. But is there anything here that could be done um, where you could actually do things, not, not that I want you to do things illegal, but is there anything that could be done on a subject to deal that can actually put people in criminal jeopardy? A lot of these properties are going to be foreclosure properties or pre-foreclosures. Stay away from government loans and loan modifications. You know, in the investor world and in the real estate world, we like to tell people that there's very little that you can do that can get you in trouble. What you can go to jail for is a loan modification. If you're trying to help someone modify their loan by using a government program, you're accepting the government money to catch up their payments, for example. I know two investors that have went to jail over that. Talk to the government and say you're going to be living in a property or the homeowner is living in the property, accept $20,000 to get them out of foreclosure and do a sub two in that way. Those government programs require that person to have like an intent to stay and live in that property. And if they're intending to sell that property to you, you can get in trouble. Okay, so basically your, your, your uh, recommendation is stay away from government loans. Yeah, and government loans are okay if just don't, don't go into one of those loan modification programs. Like 
the old Obama HAMP and HARP programs, stuff like that where you're accepting local government funds, or like Jeff was talking about earlier, the government money to get someone out of foreclosure when you're buying their house. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. Guys, I'm, I know it's getting late and I, I appreciate all your time and I want to give you all a chance to, you know, give out your contact info. Um, and, and I know, like I said, Facebook has frozen up a little bit. I'm getting comments about Facebook freezing up, but thank God we're recording this and we'll put this link out to everybody and it'll be sent out. But uh, I want to make sure everyone gets your contact info and anything you guys are doing, groups you have. Um, I'm cool with you sharing them in my group. I'm sharing your contact info because I love what you're doing. I want people to work with experts or, or people that are ethical in the business. So go down the line. Uh, if you could just give them how to get in touch with you, what you're doing now, and um, how you could bring value to the people in this group and the people that we mail this out to and see this later on, um, how can they get in touch with you or, or get in your groups or whatever you got going on? Dan, you can start off with you. Sure. My, my primary market is Texas, San Antonio. My name is Dan Diaz. You can find me on Facebook, Dancito Gancito. <laughs> uh, you can ask me later, you know, why, why I got that nickname. Um, you're more than welcome to have my, my contact information. 210-998-1714 is the office number. Especially if you're in, in town, you know, by all means, let's do lunch or coffee. Uh, I do focus on owner financing. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or, or, you know, just want to chat, hit me up. I, I don't have anything to sell. Sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, Jeff, I, I know we've, I've been waiting. I wanted to, to launch your, your, you have a great group and I, I back it 150% what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I would love you to, you know, tell people what you're doing and how they can, how they can learn more from you. Cause you have, I know you have a group specifically for this, so feel free to share it. All right. Um, first of all, if, if you want to shoot me an email, my email is Jeff at, and then it's we buy USA dot today okay um i do have a facebook group specifically for sub two called free houses sub two uh it's got a house on it the, the background is all yellow if you go to it just accept or join i don't have uh any particular privacy on it though i do check everyone personally that uh, is going to be a member. I want to make sure that they're part of other groups in real estate. We don't allow any spam or any kind of crap. It's not a marketplace. It's not a place to sell your properties. It's to talk about sub two deals. Um, and I partner with people all over the country. So if you've got a deal or you think it's a deal or we could turn it into a deal, then contact me. And I'll work with you. I'll run the numbers. I'll tell you right then and there. It, it's my opinion. Opinions are like rear ends. Everybody's got one. But I'm <laughs> going to give you my opinion and let you know. Okay? And there are a lot of people that are around. So if, you know, you've heard all of us say, don't wholesale a sub two. Uh, I'm working with three people right now that turned around. They wanted to wholesale. After talking to me, they want to work with me because they can make the wholesale money and still have a piece of the deal on the back end. And when you rather make more than a wholesale fee, you know, and God, still be part of the deal. And I'll say this, I've watched Jeff do a lot of business. And if you're doing this and you don't know what you're doing, um, you definitely want to speak to one of these gentlemen up here. Yeah. Um, maybe one of his locals, your area, maybe like work on one over or not, whatever it is. But I'm sure all of them will work with you and join venture on a deal with you or partner somehow with a deal with you. Bring them value. Don't just waste their time, please. These are guys that are, are not newbies. They're all 20 something years in the business. They're all doing deals as you can see. I'm the newbie. And I know you're, you're 2015 is when I launched. 2015. So my respects to everyone here. Yeah. You're doing it right. You know, so he's somebody who's been in it less than five years, but doing it the right way. And he's being honest and telling you why you shouldn't do certain things. So I, I can't thank you enough, Dan, for, for being on here and being so honest and, and ethical with everybody. That's why we have you on. Thank Don, you. Uh, Don, I, I got to, you know, <laughs> you know, speaks around the U.S. Uh, he's kind of on the circuit like I am. But once again, I'm going to say this to you guys. If you get a chance to hear Don speak, you know, reach out to him, see where he's speaking, when he's speaking. I know he does 
a lot in Atlanta and he does a lot in Tampa. He's constantly, he lives in the Atlanta market and he's in Tampa, both places, I think speaking almost monthly, but you know, Don, let them know how they can follow you or stay in touch or whatever it is you're doing. Um, well, the easiest way is I have many Facebook groups, so I can't really give them all to you. So I'm going to give you a couple. I'll give you my email as well. Uh, my email is simple. It's Don at DonDeRosa.com and it's spelled D-O-N-D-E-R-O-S-A. So that's my email address. Uh, all of my students have my cell phone, but I hesitate on putting out my cell phone. Yeah, on Facebook. Put so, put um, but I'm going to give you, I have uh, a couple of Facebook groups. One is called expert real estate coaching. That's one Facebook group. And the other one I'll send you to is at Atlanta real estate investors network. If you go there, you'll see all the other groups that are there if you want to belong to a lot of these other groups, but um, you can go there. We have many different ways you can get a hold of me, but the easiest way to get a hold of me if you need me is my email. And then I also have a website called htrei.com, and that's where like all my educational stuff is. So if you ever want and how to. Can, when, when's the next out. time? You know, do you know the next time you're speaking, Don? I actually do in a seminar this Saturday. Where is that? Um, it's in Atlanta. So if anybody's in Atlanta and wants to learn how to sell houses in a down market using lease options, owner finance, that's what we're covering this weekend. Um, I do a group coaching every Wednesday too. So if anybody wants to learn about that, they can. We do that online. You can be anywhere in the country for that. Because I give I give double thumbs up for Don and and Jeff stuff. Um, I'd back them 150 percent. So if you guys want to learn this, learn from the experts. I'm not the expert on subject two, so I can't teach it to you, but I refer you. I'll always have somebody in my Rolodex that's an expert. And these two gentlemen are, are, are people I refer you to. They, they both do different things. And, you know, you definitely want to have Harry on your team as well. So uh, make sure you get him before he starts drinking his bourbon because the answers could change a little bit. But uh, Harry, once again, is, is in North Carolina and South Carolina an attorney, and I don't know what else he's doing as far as, uh, uh, I don't think he's obviously, ment he's not mentoring people, I don't think, but Harry, just let people know how they can get in touch with you, how they can learn what they can do with you. Um, I know we have a ton of people, I do know we have a ton of people in this group just from the North Carolina area, and I'm sure they all know you because when I was in North Carolina, everyone told me I had to talk to you. So <laughs> just give him your, you know, however you want him to get in touch with you, shoot it. I think Jeff is still laughing about the bourbon comment. He knows my answers change when I'm drinking. But I'm easy to find. Harry Marsh Law website. Google Harry Marsh Charlotte. Uh, my email is harry at harrymarshlaw.com, 956-7498. I don't do mentoring, but like Jeff, I'll give an opinion on anything. The more money you make, the more money I make. Right. And how come so people can hire you out as an attorney or they can do deals with you? Sure. That's, that's Anything's awesome. Anything's possible. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you all being on here. I know it's getting late for you. And I, I, I was so looking forward to this, having you guys on here and, and offering this to our group. I know it froze up here, but we will be offering this out. It'll get up on YouTube. We'll send that YouTube link out to you guys. You can share it with your group. Um, and we'll make sure anyone has any questions, we get them over to you. And I appreciate your time. So with that, have a great night. And thanks again. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Dan. Thank you so much. It's been Thank a pleasure. You, man. Thank you.